So greetings, friends. Welcome to today's workshop on unfriendly persuasion, digital dark patterns awareness. I'm Bill Waters, the Lake Erie Yearly Meeting Digital Communications Facilitator. I'm so glad you could join me. Um, what we've got today is we're going to be talking about the different ways that uh, the internet and things on the internet have been designed in ways that maybe aren't in our best interest. Um, I want to just let you know about the series that we're part of. I have a Digital Issues Awareness for Friends series. This is the second session in the series. Um, we're doing it monthly on Saturday afternoons. Uh, the sessions don't directly rely on each other, so you can come to one or all of them. Um, my hope is that it will raise awareness among friends about some of the important issues that are happening in the world of technology. And it also is an opportunity to share some of the great educational materials that have been developed by different digital human rights projects. I want to do a little check-in. Uh, I've got my one of my favorite Gary Larson Farside comics here. This cat <laughs> can't believe what he's seeing outside the window. There's been an accident between Bob's assorted rodents and Al's small flightless <laughs> birds. <laughs> and he, he is captivated by the by the scene. What I like to do is to uh, get friends, if you will, uh, to share with me uh, your name, uh, your Quaker affiliation, and something you really enjoy paying attention to. We're going to be talking about sort of the attention economy and 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 that sort of thing. So I thought I'd start with what is something that you enjoy paying attention to in your world. I'm going to go down my list that I have of participants, and that puts Bob at the top of the list. <clears throat> Well, I'm Bob Ream. I'm in Columbus, Ohio. I'm not at home. I'm at a public library between two meetings that are physically about 100 feet away from me at different times. So it's very nice to be able to connect online. Um, I'm a member of North Columbus Friends Meeting, I'm active with FLGBTQC. Should I spell that out? Or does everybody know what that means? It's fine. Friends for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer Concerns. Um, they often serve as a sounding board for me when I have a question of a larger Quaker um, group. I'm involved in a lot of different social justice issues, and since at 4 o'clock Eastern, I'll be meeting with the Ohio Transportation Justice Coalition. I'll talk about transportation not being available to everyone equally. So that's, that's a topic I focus on, among others. Thank you, Bob. Jeff Brieger, can you introduce yourself? <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Jeff Brieger. Um, uh, was uh, living in um, Underhill Woods and a member of Birmingham Friends Meeting. Um, uh, I enjoy paying attention principally to the various uh well i probably I'll, I'll say the weather is my first first interest every day so thank you i'll leave it that yes uh inga uh inga brieger also member of birmingham friends meeting uh at the moment i'm very much uh, involved with uh, uh starting to do taxes um I'm doing it through AARP. This is volunteer ring and doing it for free. And I'm fixed on getting the max for people within the law. Very good. And Sprague and company. My name is Ann Sprague. Uh, I live in Windsor and that's where I am right now. But um, we're a member, I'm a member of the Detroit Friends Meeting, have been for a long time. I um I enjoy I enjoy paying attention. Uh, I think part of this is the result of COVID, but to nature, to the world around me, to my dog. Um, I, someone told me that a good way to meditate was to stop when my dog stopped and notice what he was noticing. So that's been an interesting little discipline, and uh, I I enjoy paying attention as well to really good and well written information about the world so that I'm clear about what's going on. 
Thank you. I'm company. I'm uh, Bob Orr. <laughs> I'm a member of the Detroit Friends Meeting. And uh, I think what I'm really enjoying uh, looking at now or uh, around the world is shadows. I'm taking a watercolor painting class and I'm trying to learn how to paint shadows. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Looks like Barbara's next on my list. <clears throat> Barbara Lesage from North Columbus Friends Meeting. And I particularly enjoy paying attention to children that are between the ages of one and two and when they are in that discovery of how things work and they can just be so focused and intrigued with gravity and um, getting a lid to go on a cup. And that I just, I love their sense of learning and discovery. Thank you. The more houses. Uh, Becky Morehouse here, a member of Ann Arbor Friends Meeting. And um, so I'm paying a lot of attention right now to our local meeting, Ann Arbor, because I'm an assistant clerk and kind of have to follow a lot of things. But I also watch the political divide, which is so uncomfortable, and, and who's making the rules, the current rules and laws. Thank you. Clement. Um, <clears throat> oh, Steve's here too. <laughs> okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, hi, Steve Morehouse. Uh, I just slid in, I was enjoying lunch. That was my main interest uh, right now, but I think I'll be eating in front of people. Um, I think one thing that uh, kind of fascinates me is just uh, being present and observing what's around. And I've kind of gotten caught up in um, looking behind the obvious because so many things come at us with the media and just um, a lot of things, you know, you look out the window and something's obvious there. Well, look beyond that, look, uh, see what else is out there that you're not seeing because the one thing's taking your attention. So that's kind of fun, especially, you know, with politicians on TV, see what their uh, people behind them are doing facially. Um, there's all kinds of applications of it, but uh, it's it's sort of um, a little bit like uh, looking behind the screen, you know, uh, see what's there. So that's kind of fun. Thank you. Clements. Hello, I'm Clemence Ravasson Rashan. I am a member of Pittsburgh Monthly Meeting, but I uh, try to get, um, uh, meet with uh, Erie Worship Group whenever I can, and I'm very grateful for some a milder winter than usual because I've been able to get up to Erie more often than than usual, and um, because I live on a hundred acres, uh, nature's always calling. But one of the things in recently that I've been paying attention to is so many ways in which my white privilege uh, has helped me in life in, in such a way as I never recognized and how others are not so privileged. So this has been a real uh, awakening to me when I thought for many years I was so wide awake. Thank you. Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Harmon Jones. I'm part of the Birmingham meeting. And um, right now, I seem to be paying a lot of attention to, on the bright side of things, the transition from winter to spring and noticing how our days are getting a little bit longer. Thank you. Joel and Sharon. Sorry about that, uh, the late reaction. Uh, I'm Joel Lottenbright, a member of the Detroit Friends Meeting. Uh, what grabs my attention these days are probably first and most, uh, foremost my grandchildren. So as long as they're not around, I can attend to other things, but as soon as they walk through the door, it's my attention is <laughs> gotta be 100% focused. Um, I like um, also uh, focused on meditation and a, a lot with technology, new technologies that changing. Okay, and uh, 
Lately, I've been using uh, Chat GPT. Really enjoy it. Uh, today, I had it told it to make stories uh, for my grandchildren at their grade level, and it just did an amazing job. Thank you. Um, Sharon Ottenwright from Detroit Friends Meeting. Um, probably, I enjoy paying attention to nature, and I was looking outside today to see how many plants might fool to come up early, <laughs> <Yeah>. and uh, <laughs> I didn't notice any yet. Um, and also paying attention to, um, I think what Barbara had said too about uh, seeing how young children are developing, um, especially with our grandchildren. I never had the time to do it with our own children, it seemed like, but uh, now I'm appreciating it more, so. Thank you. Sally. So I'm Sally Weaver-Summer from Bluffton, Ohio, part of Broadmead Monthly Meeting. Um, I'm enjoying paying attention to um, late um, 1800s in London. Uh, we're reading a series of novels um, and uh, just understanding all the social ills then and things that are happening and the whole issues of class and poverty and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's one of my interests right now. Thank you. And Tom Kangas will wrap us up. Hi, I'm Tom Kangas, a member of North Columbus Friends Meeting, and I'm enjoying paying attention to our cat. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great to have you all with us. I, I'm getting some twofers here, two, two, one screen, two people. Very nice. So let's look at the agenda. Um, it's a pretty full agenda. I want to talk about Quakers and honesty. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of designing for engagement. And then I want to dip, dip into the kind of the bulk of the matter, which is what is deceptive design? Look at some different types and examples of it. And I have a, a little design quiz, sort of a learning moment uh, it, that we might do in breakup groups. Maybe we'll just do it together. Um, and then I want to talk a bit about what's being done to address deceptive design and think together, uh, what's a Quaker to do? Um, imagining like if we were to write a query about like, that could be read at the rise of meeting to would address some of these issues, what would it sound like? What would a query related to this topic be like? And then I have a, a hot list of interesting resources to share. Uh, what I've done with the slides is I've made lots of links that are that are hot, like interactive, so that when you get pick up the slides after the event, you'll be able to click on those links and, and go to these different places. Looks like there's a, a person joining us, uh, another, another person joining us, very good. Um, Lauren, do you wanna say, how do you do? Introduce us where you're from. Hello, I'm sorry for being late. Uh, just signing on in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I am also here with my baby who's 10 months old, so <laughs> yeah. Very good for joining us. We uh, talked about things we like paying attention to. At least two of our participants like to look at young kids and their learning and as they develop and or grandkids and all of that. So you, you're in good company. All Thank right. you for joining us. Thank okay. you. Okay. So let's get into this agenda. Uh, Quakers and honesty. Uh, Quakers have had this long reputation for honest business practices. Um, there's a Planet Money story, uh, NPR Planet Money. And there's a quote here. For most of human history, you had to haggle over prices before you could buy something. The Quakers were among the first people to commit to fixed prices. They did it because it was good morals. Turned out it was also good business. You can see a picture of a, this is a spring for buggies, honest Quaker spring picture there. Uh, but the idea was, is that you didn't have to haggle when you went into a Quaker business because the price was, was laid out and was the same for rich people and poor people. And uh, uh, Quakers built these businesses by focusing on good reputation. There are a number of uh, periods of time when Quakers were some of the most successful business people in England and in the United States. You might know about um, Macy's, which was a, Macy was a Quaker and Macy's department store was, a, was the second big store to take and use price tags across all of its products. Uh, and so, there's also currently there's a Quakers and business group that continues to try to promote honest business practices. 
uh, they have a series of principles and they try to, to um, encourage other businesses that are Quaker to live up to these principles and sort of promote them. So there's this idea that we should do things in a straightforward way, a trustworthy way, so that people will um, come back and, be and believe in us. Um, the interesting thing about this story, the, the birth and death of the price tag on Planet Money is that nowadays with Amazon and online shopping, the fixed prices are going away again, where the same product can be different prices for different people when they go online based on how, how important it seems to you, um, a variety of things. So the, the fixed price, the age of the price tag may be waning again. Um, so let's talk about this idea of designing for engagement. Um, there's this idea that uh, the uh, way things are designed affects how we interact with them. Uh, this is a quote from Canva is a, is a service that helps people produce material uh, um, images that can be used for, for in social media or on websites. And they just sort of explain the idea of design. Design has the potential to evoke emotional reactions in your audience. Use this to your advantage. Whether your design's purpose is to encourage people to buy a product, attend an event, sign up for a newsletter, or browse your website, your audience is more likely to follow through when they connect emotionally with your design. Um, but there's this thing about um, apps and the, the way that uh, applications and websites make money these days is they try to increase the number of people who participate in their their content and how long they, how much time they spend on it. Uh, this is a quote um, from, there's an article glued to your phone. Here's how to rethink your relationship with social media. This quote, it's no secret that apps and social media companies are competing for consumers' attention. The more time spent on an app or platform, the better. And that means a series of design choices have been made to slowly but surely keep us locked in. When media studies professor Shaka Glotton uses an app like Facebook or Twitter, they sometimes wonder whether using social media can be considered a consensual interaction at this point. How much of our social media behavior is ours and how much of it is influenced by the medium itself? This idea is like, is it really consensual these days or are we being sort of uh, worked or manipulated? If you've ever tried to read the terms of service for different things you're joining, nobody reads the terms of service, we just say, Yes, <laughs> take me take me to the service. And there's a lot in there. Uh, it's very interesting to kind of go, dig in a little bit. Um, so the, one of the topics for today is this idea of unfriendly persuasion or perhaps addictive behavior. Uh, I want to talk to you about this idea of ludic loops. There's a psychologist, Natasha Dow, who spent many years studying gamblers in Las Vegas. And she developed a term uh, called the ludic loop. And it's sort of like the zone of comfort you enter when engaged in a repetitive activity that gives you occasional rewards. I don't know if you've ever seen people at a slot machine where they just sit there for hours and pull that, pull that slot. And the idea is that it has to be intermittent rewards. If it was predictable, it wouldn't be as interesting. But there also have to be sort of a zone where you're just sort of in your, you're just sort of, it's just me in the machine or just me in the app. And I'm sort of in this space. This intentional design puts you in a calm, inattentive state. The cycle of anticipation and feedback is key to hitting the most important metrics, clicks and time on site. It's perhaps no wonder many social media platforms and mobile games and apps in general are designed to keep you engaged for as long as possible. In the um, venture funding world where applications get money from people who are investing in them, they set goals for increasing the number of users they have and the amount of time on site as metrics to see if they can get that next round of funding from their, their funders. So there's a lot of intensity in this whole idea. Um, Nir Eyal wrote a book called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And he identified a basic model that designers have been using. You can see a, an image of it here there's a trigger, something that calls your attention to going to the particular app or space. There's an action that gets taken. Uh, there are variable rewards. Uh, they, there's some encouragement to get you invested in the, the, the app, and then it gets into a sort of a loop. So an example you could have would be a dating app. 
where uh, you are uh, interested in your signal and you're interested in starting to date. So you uh, f find this dating app and uh, you, uh, the action you take is you, you click on the, the app, you get it started and it, it will show you some, like the, the initial action might be to browse a few profiles of other people. Uh, if you're not speaking, maybe you could mute yourself. I think I'm getting a little bit of background sound. Um, so uh, then as you're looking at these profiles, some of them are very attractive and others are just sort of not, not your thing. So you're getting variable reward. You're not seeing all great, amazing things. You're seeing some good and some, some bad. Similar to image browsing sites where you'll see some images that are beautiful and some that are not so great. And then the, the dating app might ask you to, could you update your profile? Tell us more about yourself or decide how, what kind of notifications you wanna receive from us. Um, and then they'll send you an alert uh, triggering you to go back into the, somebody's noticed your, your profile. So there's an alert comes up, you go back into the thing and you get into this loop. And after a while, they're hoping that you're no longer going to need an external trigger. Whenever you're feeling a little lonely or something, you're going to go to that, to that spot. So this hook model was well-developed. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with B.F. Skinner, uh, who worked on the idea of uh, enforcement, uh, reinforcement. Uh, he studied pigeons in, in the World War, trying to train pigeons. And they found that if you had a, a lever and the, the pigeon got food, every time the lever was pulled, they would just pull it when they were hungry. But if food only came out once in a while, they kept pulling at it and fussing with that lever all the time because they wanted to, you know, waiting for the chance when the food would, would show up. So it's a sort of intermittent reward thing, which gets us, gets us hooked. So um, you start to think about our mobile devices. We've really moved a long way to smartphones and, and mobile devices. So uh, the Tactical Tech Group, which I'm a big fan of, um, has a short video here talking about there's six different ways that the, uh, mobile developers are sort of catching our attention, sort of hooking us onto our devices, rewarding everything that we do with little stars or, or likes or things, feeding the desire to get ahead, creating sort of a, a competitions, cultivating a sense of urgency, keeping it emotional, cat videos or smileys or different things generating a fear of missing out. There's new things that you might miss if you don't stay active and making it really easy to keep going. So I thought we could just take, let, take a look to listen to this little video. Six easy steps to get us addicted to our phones. What are the most common design tricks used to addict us to our apps? Who's responsible for the way that we interact with our technology? And should we be blaming ourselves for not putting down our phones? We all know that warm, fuzzy feeling when someone likes your post. Simple design tactics can feed into this sense of being wanted, even if it's just to know that someone is typing a response. What do you feel when you see the typing bubble, the red confirmation, or that your photo has been liked? True stories take six times longer to reach people than fake ones. And if the story is worth reading, then who really cares if it's true or not? The point is that emotionally charged content gets clicks. And whether it's a cute cat, gifts, celebrity breakups, or a life hack, the internet is made of these bite-sized chunks of information. How easily would you follow a meme or clickbait? Did you know that what you see has been tested on thousands of people to find the best possible image, the most irresistible title to get you to click on it? friends or just followers. There's not much of a difference because we're all social creatures. Who doesn't want to be liked? Quantifying friends and interactions means that we will spend more time online so that we can nurture and extend our social circle. How often do you check how many people follow you? How often do you want to retweet, reblog, or forward to all of your followers to increase your own status? Whether hanging out with friends, online, or in a game, nobody wants to feel left out. Designing apps as social hubs with all the joys and fears of everyday life means that you want to stay involved. You don't want to miss out on new trends like stickers, limited releases, offers, and other rewards. Everyone else is there. What are they doing? If you're not there, you might miss out. 
Sound and movement create a strong sense of urgency. Being available involves all the senses. Notifications come with movement and sounds, and they pop up to distract you through all your interconnected devices. And they're good at finding you in those moments when you're just thinking what to do next. There's no dead end on the internet. Frictionless design combined with bottomless content means that we can stay online for hours without even thinking about it. Autoplay will make it easier to select the next irresistible thing to watch. Infinite scrolling will satisfy your need for rewarding content. Pull to refresh is like a nice surprise waiting for you in every loading of the screen. And there is always the next thing to do, have, get, see, or achieve. The makers of apps, content, and platforms rely on our constant attention. This entire ecosystem depends on keeping us engaged. Value is assessed by how many users services have, what users do on their platform, and how often. Engineers, designers, and psychologists work together to make sure that we are constantly drawn in, designing for addiction. Does it matter how our data is used to nudge us, provoke us, and form our habits? Do we mind that our attention is turned into value? Is the instant reward worth the total sharing of our online likes, dislikes, habits and behaviours? And are we to blame for not putting down our phones? Or have we been hooked? So, have we been hooked? Uh, I know my phone is near me a lot these days. It used to be I didn't care about it so much, but now it's sort of by my side all the time. Um, so some folks have said that the good days of the internet are behind us. Others, of course, dream of the future. But uh, this particular developer, Gang Yi, he, he says that the web experience today is gone, gone to hell, so to speak. Uh, the horrors of contemporary browsing, surfing the web isn't what it used to be. The halcyon day era of peaceful browsing on clean sites is now a distant memory. Today's internet is a digital hellscape of pop-up ads, notification prompts, and paywall blocks. So he made a little demo uh, where you could try out to sort of what was the web looking like for him these days. And I recorded the demo but while I was clicking on it so you can have a quick look at it. You search for something and then you get a result. And then you have to deal with cookies. And there's different ways you can customize the cookies. There's a tricky button saying accept all, which we've just tried to customize it. Do you want to be notified? No. Do you want to subscribe? There's an ad blocker you're using. You're shamed for trying to block ads. You're invited to buy something. Mm -hmm. You finally get to the thing, and then you get this mess. Oh, uh, yeah. And then you scroll, and there's something else that pops up. Does this seem familiar? Yeah. There, there's a lot more popping and stuff happening these days than there used to be. So uh, you could argue that the uh, web experience has degraded uh, and some of these pressures about keeping us engaged and, and selling ads has become a, a problem for us. What I want to look at now is um, not just general design principles, but ones that could be considered to be deceptive on, on purpose. Uh, they're also called dark patterns. The guy, Harry Brignell, who started kind of researching this, developed the term. Of course, we know that thinking of something that's dark as bad and something that light is good can be a bias, a prejudicial sort of a statement. But the term deceptive design and dark patterns have both become very commonplace in usage. So what are so-called dark patterns? Uh, dark patterns are design tricks based on human psychology that are used to provoke or manipulate people into signing up for something, buying something, or giving away more personal information than they thought or intended. Uh, this picture here, there's an ad showing download, download, where the actual download link is a little red, a little red thing over here. This is this is the distraction on the side. Uh, so I have a video here that explains and some gives an example or two of what dark patterns are all about. 
Dark patterns are features of interface design, crafted to trick users into doing things that they might not want to do, but which benefit the business in question. Here's an example. Have you ever tried to delete your Amazon account? Here's the Amazon homepage. What's the first thing you might think to do? The obvious place to look is the account dropdown here. Once you're in here, you look around, it's a lot of information, but if I'm interested in deleting my account, I think that your account is probably a good place to go. Once I'm on this page, there's a lot more information, payment options, login and security, and a bunch of stuff down here. Unfortunately, you could click every link on your account page, but none would deliver you to a place where you could actually delete it, because it's not here. In order to actually delete your Amazon account, you have to go all the way down to the bottom of the page and under let us help you click help once you're in here you have to navigate to need more help because you know putting it on this page would just be too easy then click contact us this is where it starts to get ridiculous it's still nowhere to be seen but of the four options on the top that you want help with click prime or something else you want the something else in this tell us more about your issue drop down there's still nothing that suggests account deletion you just have to know to click login and security and then in a second drop down there it is the magic button, close my account. Except in order to actually do that, you now have to have a chat conversation with an Amazon associate who's gonna tell you all the reasons account deletion is a bad idea. See, you can't delete the account yourself. They have to do it for you. This is a dark pattern, a crappy user experience that intentionally makes it difficult, almost impossible without help, to do something that hurts Amazon. UX specialist Harry Brignall categorizes this specific kind of dark pattern as a roach motel, a design that makes it very easy for you to get into a situation, but very hard to get out. Brignall is actually the one who coined the term dark pattern in 2010, and he's been cataloging and lecturing about the issue ever since. Many of these dark patterns we're all familiar with. I only have to search my email for a few seconds to find one. For example, here, I'm getting spam emails from Architectural Digest. I scroll down and look at that. This is a mess, but it's a mess on purpose. The unsubscribe link is here, but it's devilishly hard to see. That's because it's the same font and virtually the same color as the rest of the fine print. Here's another dark pattern that uses color to misdirect. Over at the user testing blog, Jennifer Jerome points out that the mobile game Two Dots carries you through the experience by offering green buttons. A green button to start the game, a green button to pick a level, a green button to start the level, and three green buttons to continue to the next level, and so on. But once you lose a level, the color scheme changes. The first green button you see leads you right to an in-app purchase, while the continue button is just a little X that blends into the larger element. I wonder how many people clicked buy moves reflexively as a Pavlovian response. Now, to be fair, this is a pretty benign dark pattern, but it shows how companies can use something as simple as color to trick you into doing what they want. On the more egregious end of the spectrum, you have stuff like this banner ad for Chatmost, which is made to look like it has a speck of dust on it, causing people to to brush it away and accidentally click the link. Or you have sites like Booking.com where they do everything in their power to increase the urgency of a purchase, going so far as to alert you in big red notifications of the hotel rooms that you just missed. I mean, you better book now. You don't want to be left behind again, do you? Every once in a while, a company goes a little too far and actually breaks the law. Remember when you used to get spam with all those LinkedIn invites from friends? Well, that was because of a confusion using dark pattern on their ad contacts page, which allowed LinkedIn to scoop up people's email contacts and send them messages repeatedly without their consent. In a comprehensive blog post, Dan Schlosser showed how LinkedIn tried to trick users eight times in their sign up and onboarding procedures into surrendering their email contacts. Unfortunately for LinkedIn, this proved to be a step too far. Users filed a legal challenge claiming that sending multiple unwarranted emails hurt their professional reputation. LinkedIn settled the dispute for $13 million dollars, which came out in the end to about $10 per user. It's rare for dark patterns to face consequences like these. Mostly they stay just on the right side of the law, understanding that it's hard to legislate around the psychological tricks of UX design. Everything on the internet is fighting for your attention, but there's a difference between those who are taking the time to build trust and loyalty and the special offer you clicked which actually enrolled you in a monthly subscription, or the social network that dark patterned you into letting it sell data that you didn't even know it had. Some of the responses 
responsibility is on us, but some is on design too. And it's not the fault of the designers, they're just doing what they're tasked to do, knowing full well that if they don't, others will. As Brignall says, our best defense against the dark patterns is to be aware of them and shame the companies who utilize them. Design is what... So, uh, that Amazon Roach Motel is quite the example. Uh, trying to get get through that is something else. So this is uh, Harry Brignell's uh, list of the common types. Uh, just talk about them uh, in the um, slides after the fact. You can click on each of these red titles and see an example or two of this particular type. But trick questions uh, where you it's hard to know what the right answer is. Sneaking into your shopping cart. Uh, Roach Motel, we saw an example of privacy zuckering, which is based on um, the idea that your information, maybe your phone number or things that you don't want shared are getting shared because of the way Facebook or something handles privacy. Uh, price comparison prevention, um, misdirection, something blinking over here while you, you really should be focusing over there. Hidden costs like cleaning fees or service fees that pop up at the end of a shopping experience when you're getting ready to complete the, the thing. Bait and switch, you try to do one thing and you get something else. Confirm shaming, where you're confirming you don't want to subscribe and it says something mean <laughs> to you. <laughs> you have to click on the mean thing. Disguised ads, forced continuity, where you have a free trial that then suddenly starts charging you. There's a big example of that with a ABC children's game where uh, there was a free trial and then uh, parents were getting charged monthly, like $50 a month for something that they didn't know that they had signed up for. And then they finally were sued, but it was sort of, it was hard to get away from the, the continuity. And then friend spam is the example where it, it wants to take your address book, your phone book, and then grab all that information, sell it or use it or do something with it. So uh, have people seen any of these in action? Are there any of these that you are, can relate to? Anybody want to share a, a quick example of one that they've run into? Hi, this is Cynthia. Um, one I can think of is, is um, when you go to purchase something in Amazon and put it in your shopping cart and you don't quite check out and then you get the message hurry up there's only three <laughs> items left like, is there really three items left <laughs> thank you creating a sense of urgency yes i have uh, steve uh trying to unsubscribe for a long time i was just ignoring things not trying to respond anyway and then i started opening them and going down and finding where to unsubscribe and on uh, one type of uh, ad that uh, I was trying to unsubscribe from, I successfully, or felt like I successfully went through their whole game of having three or four steps to do that. Then I started getting inundated with a whole bunch of similar emails from uh, what would appear to be a different company, a different name. And, and uh, those kept coming and you try to unsubscribe, uh, unsubscribe from those. And that just creates more coming at you. Um, uh, I certainly am aware of that. <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, uh, <clears throat> I, I have a little example. Uh, I'm addicted to Wordle <laughs> from the New York Times. But when you look into it in more depth, there's the opportunity to get your your uh, moves analyzed, but suddenly there's a message: well, you've used up your five freebies, and now you need to subscribe. Mm. <laughs> and this, of course, is, is infuriating because, among other things, we we do subs have a subscription, but you can't get around this on on the on the internet. You actually have to contact. Uh, people and to tell them to fix this up. Gotcha. <laughs> so okay. That's pretty misleading. Bill, Let's I see. had one. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> um this is Wink. I when I started um using email, I had the email address wcoventry at Mac dot com. 
And since then, Apple has given me two more addresses that I didn't ask for. And that's another reason it's hard to unsubscribe because you have to go back and look, wait, which did they send it to? And I haven't tried to get rid of those addresses. I don't know if that would be possible or if I'd lose something, I don't know. But right. But so all those addresses go get to you, but they're different ones. Different, yeah. they, they look different in practice. Good example. Yep. Okay. Well, um, there's some patterns uh, in terms of interface designers. Uh, they have tried to categorize these different types, uh, and they've got some some broad strategies. Nagging you, where you keep getting nagged over and over again. Obstruction, where it's really hard to get to the thing you need to do. Sneaking, interface interference, where the way the interface is set up makes it very hard to complete your thing. Or forced action, where you're you're kind of going down a tunnel and you can't get to what you want until you've gone through these other steps. Um, there was a 2021 analysis, researchers at Princeton University looked at lots of different research, uh, different people who've collected these and, and they are trying to figure out what, how do we decide what makes something deceptive? And they, uh, there are a number of mechanisms that sub subvert user intent, confuse users, manipulate users or undermine user autonomy. And they did this whole classification system of obf obfuscation, nagging and camouflage advertising were all, all common strategies. So um, I thought uh, deceptive design didn't start with the internet. And I thought this was sort of a fascinating example. The National Socialist Germany had a ballot in favor of Adolf Hitler. And the ballot uh, text reads, do you agree with the reunification of Austria with the German Reich that was enacted on 13 March, 1938? And do you vote for the party of our leader, Adolf Hitler? The large circle is labeled yes, the smaller no. The circle size discrepancy is notable enough as a dark pattern, but also the joining of two very separate questions into one answer is a dark pattern. So this goes way back, this idea of sort of being deceptive. Um, here's an example that I ran across just recently. I um, There's a, a, a program called Audacity. Some of you who've worked with audio files might be familiar with it. It's been around a long time. It's open source and free and very, very powerful. Uh, but it has certain libraries, so you can you can read all the different audio types that are out there. You have to install additional libraries into it because in order to keep it free, they can't ship the the tool with these libraries, or it would it would violate some rule. So you have to go out and get the library and, and attach the two together to make it work. So I went to do that because I had re hadn't updated it in a long time, and I come to this page about finding my download, and you've got this. I'm in the right place. And then there's this giant ad right in the middle of the page that has a download button. So I'm, I'm coming to download something. And I come to this place and there's a, it says start download. And there's a download button, but that's an ad. Down below, here's what I need for my Macintosh is way down here. But the, the way the ad was written and the image that's included in it, you, you would likely hit that blue button and be downloading something that you don't want. <laughs> on your computer rather than the, the thing that you do want. So this is an example of disguised ads. Another really ugly disguised ad on your phone. This pops up on your phone. It says, phone is slow, uh, inviting you to adjust the speed and performance of your device. If you touch the slider, you've gone to their site. You've, you've now uh, in, gone, so it's an ad, not a, not a setting on your phone. And it wants to install something that you didn't ask for and don't want. Uh, pretty ugly. Uh, hard to cancel examples. Uh, the clothing retailer Savage X Fenty. Uh, it makes it possible to sign up for a membership online. But if you want to cancel your subscription, you have to call customer service and wait. <laughs> you have to get in the queue and wait for your opportunity. You can see there it says you can call. You can cancel at any time. Just be prepared to wait. Another example from Prime Video, you can watch Prime Video in the app, but if you want to cancel your, your Prime Video subscription, your cancel your Prime membership, you can't do it. You have to go to a, a desktop computer and go online. 
to, to find it and, and start the process. So you can do it in the app. You can, you can get hooked in the app, but you can't get unhooked in the app. Uh, Bob, you got a comment? Yeah, the, I don't know when to make this comment, so I'll make it now. I have multiple vision impairments and using my smartphone, the pushing my index finger to move and to scroll up and down is almost exactly the same as touching on a button to select something. Mm -hmm. And I often get notices from websites which believe that I have ordered something or whatever when I have not, because it was on my blind side, I just happened to touch the wrong button at the wrong time. I've also that gotten a lot. I've been getting hit with things saying your Norton security system is being renewed. You know, it's an email telling me something I'd never purchased. It's it's a trick to get me to go in there and give my information. Uh, so sometimes this mail it acts like you've subscribed to something where you actually haven't. Here's another unsubscribe one where the the color of the link Zynga gaming Zynga uh, was it Farmville was a Zynga game. Some of these uh, mobile games, the unsubscribe link on the top, you can see the, the unsubscribe here is in white on top of white. So you, you can't see it unless you sort of hover over the second image down below is when you've highlighted the text. And you can see when you highlight the text that the unsubscribe here is, is off to the right side. So it's, okay. it's hidden and you sort of have to just magically find it. Now here's a tricky, and this is a tricky text box one. This is Virgin Active. Um, they're opting out of their marketing and promotions requires unticking the first checkbox and leaving the second checkbox ticked. So I'm gonna read this to you. It's, it's maddening just to try to stay up with this. By providing your details, you agree that we can contact you, including by electronic means such as email, SMS, and MMS, about promotions, special offers, and discounts from Virgin Active. If you would prefer not to hear about these, please untick this box. So the first one you is, if you don't want it, you're gonna untick it. We would also like to share your information with other Virgin companies and other carefully selected organizations so that they may contact you from time to time, including by electronic means, such as email, SMS, and MS, about promotions, special offers, and discounts we may think could be of interest to you. Please untick this box if you would like to hear about these. So if you untick one, if you untick both, you're, you're, you're caught, caught in the loop. Uh, it's ugly. Here's another tricky text box. I want to ask people to tell me what's the right answer in this one. Uh, it says you're trying to uninstall something that you, you don't want on your computer. Are you sure you want to uninstall? The uninstallation process requires your browsers to be closed. All unsaved work in your browsers may be lost. Would you like to abort this process to verify your work is saved? Yes, no, or cancel. How do you... What's the right answer? Is it yes that you want to un uninstall or yes to aborting the process? I hate these. How about leaving the page? How about leaving the page? <laughs> well, what if you really need to get rid of the thing? It's tricky business. Uh, there's a term, deceptive design and dark patterns. There's another term that's being used on Reddit called asshole design. And this might fall into that category where it's it's intentionally <laughs> just terrible. Um, here's a couple of sneak into basket examples. This is a, a flower shop on the left, Ava's Flowers, where Ava has added a greeting card to your order, thinking that they, you might really want that additional $4 greeting card. And not what you were ordering, but there it is. Or in the cellular outfitter, uh, they will want to include with your purchase, they want to add a, a screen protector. The red line was not there in the original, but it's put there to just let, show you what's happening there. Um, sneaking into your cart. This is, uh, you know, when you get airline stuff, there's oftentimes insurance that might be added or other things when you're trying to travel insurance or things like that. Uh, how about so hard to say no? Uh, this is uh, Instagram. Uh, you want to, would you like to turn on notifications on Instagram? And you're like, I really don't. I don't want to be bothered by Instagram. It won't let you say no. It just says not now. 
and it will come back and bug you periodically, you know, you really are going to get nagged by this thing until you say yes. <laughs> Here's a Yahoo hard to say no. Uh, are you sure you want to unsubscribe? You've come to the unsubscribe page. You do want to unsubscribe. That's why you're there. And it says, are you sure you want to unsubscribe? No, cancel. Uh, what you really want is yes, unsubscribe from all marketing messages, which is the link down below. It's not the button, it's the link. So the big blue button is not what you want. <laughs> okay, so what I thought I would like to try is maybe breakout groups is not the way to do this. Maybe we should just have people try this on your desktop computer. Hopefully you won't lose the thread and lose the zoom in, in the screen. But what I'm going to do is share with you a link in the chat here. People with a desktop computer, if you could open that up. Um, I guess we could do it together, but I think we have people could try it on their own. What you should get is it goes to bit.ly first and then it jumps over to this much longer link at the markup. And then it should go down to their dark patterns quiz. And what it does is it shows you an image like the one I have on the screen. Uh, and it says, is this a dark pattern or not? And then when you click on a choice, it, it shows you either the, the opposite, the thing that would not be a dark pattern and what is a dark pattern. Are people get, able to get there? Let's no, see. I'm not, I'm not able to click on anything. Okay. Because you should be able to click on the red or the green button in the quiz. <laughs> Oh, do we first have to click on the bit.ly link? Right, yeah, the picture on my screen won't let you do it. This is just an image I'm showing you. Um, click on the chat. There you go. Oh, on, in the chat. Yeah, I'm sorry. Got it, now Steve found that, yeah. The mock-up. Yeah, it's the markup, and then it has, it's just sort of a, yes. maybe six okay. different examples where it's encouraging you to kind of decide, does this look sketchy or does this look good? But it's a switch to the 10% discount okay. if you sign up for the letter. Okay, don't read it to us, Jeff. Oh. No, I like paying more than I need to. <laughs> <laughs> and the one that you see might be different from your neighbors because it randomly assigns which one you're going to get. So the quiz is sort of just a little random. Are you able to click on the click on the questions on the markup link? Uh, I'm not in it right now. I'm staying in the slides. I decided I don't want to leave the slides. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But what what are we to do? Uh, make a as choice you go down the page, you you. Click one and it gives you an answer as to what's true and what's not. And then you go down to the next yeah. question and you go down through them. Okay. And you have to decide how sketchy is this thing. If you sign up for our email, so it looks like it's blank. Um, Sorry. I'm going to mute bad. everyone so you can talk with your neighbor. So could folks give me any any sense? What did you discover in this little quiz? Any anything that you noticed? Just a few comments I'd welcome. <clears throat> you have to unmute yourself to share. I muted everybody. I was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think of you that way, Wink. <clears throat> I don't know if I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this, I guess this, is where, this is where you need a phone a friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In a, in a couple instances, um, I said something was dark design and they said, no, that was ethical design. And I, while I get the point, I also felt like, well, even so I felt a little manipulated. 
Okay. So there's grades of manipulation. There's there's shades of it. I see. Joel, did you have a hand up? <clears throat> Uh, the only comment was, uh, yeah, I, the, uh, I was a little bit uh, too sinister as well. Um, uh, the one that had the um, added the service fee for the TV, it was it was in very small print. So, but uh, evidently, small print is okay as long as it's there. Yeah, it can't be tricky though. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, Sally. I well, so I. I I think you said they were in different order for different people, maybe. Mm -hmm. But for mine, I, I got the first one was not dark design, and I got that correct. The second one I missed, um, but I could readily see what they were saying. And then I got the other all four right. So I think um, it was helpful to kind of miss one to see, oh, yeah, OK, I get what they're what they're getting at um i thought the exercise was helpful because it made me think more clearly about what was clear and what wasn't clear <laughs> yeah so there's really no wrong clicking because you get information either way when you click on the answer <clears throat> okay well thank you for that um the markup is a group that does some really interesting work so i appreciate them making that available <clears throat> So I want to turn now to a topic that has really hit us hard with the election season we just passed through, uh, political persuasion and personal data. I, um, I'm a big fan of the Tactical Tech Group, and they did a deep dive into personal data and political persuasion, where they, they found, I think it was like 400 companies that were making a living off of collecting our personal information and selling it to election people. Uh, and so they talk about some of the different ways that they do that in terms of building personality profiles. And and uh, this all depends on being able to scoop up the information about you, your use patterns and stuff from the, the games you play, from the um, different uh, interests that you've shown in the past, the different contributions you've made to other groups, that sort of thing. I'm getting a cramp in my leg. I'm standing up here. But uh, they have a... a sort of a, an online display of different things that they discovered uh, that is available in the, this link here. I'm not going to take us there today, but I just want to read this quote from them. All the data-driven methods presented in this guide would not exist without the commercial digital marketing, marketing and advertising industry. From analyzing behavioral data to A-B testing and from geo-targeting to psychometric profiling, Political parties are using the same techniques to sell political candidates to voters that companies use to sell shoes to consumers. The question is, is this appropriate? And what impact does it have, not only on individual voters who may or may not be persuaded, but on the political environment as a whole? Um, it's it's really interesting. So I, I went a little bit deeper into the, the political email space because I, I got swamped by emails during the the politics season in my particular inbox. And so I was looking at this group from Princeton University's Center for Information Technology Policy. They collected uh, 435,000 political emails. They created these fake users who then made a donation and kind of tracked how that email was used. Um, and so they, they gathered these emails and they made them available to other researchers so they could publish stories about it and, and see sort of what was going on. They found that the majority of emails use dark patterns to manipulate voters and trick donors. Approximately 70% of the Trump campaign emails, about 40% of the, ballot, the Biden campaign emails contained at least one of the six tactics that they identified. Um, the, the tactics that they use related to email, using sensationalist or clickbait subject lines to encourage them you to open it, using forward referencing or information withholding so you have to, if you want to find out what they're talking about, you have to open the email to see what they're actually talking about. Creating a false sense of urgency to create a fear of loss response. Obscuring the name of the sender to encourage the reader to open the email. You're not sure if it's from a friend or from the politics group. Using fake threads, a trick which makes the email look like it's part of an ongoing conversation you've already had. Or inserting bogus re and forward markers to make it look like the email was a reply or a forward from someone. So we're going to take a little a closer look at this. 
So you can see here a couple of emails examples where the first one, the from field has been changed from the actual sender. So it's instead it says midnight deadline uh, to make this email seem more urgent and pressing. Uh, they've added Marie in terms of the subject, Marie Lindsey Graham, to make it look like this is part of a reply that's just something that you, you've asked about Lindsey and now they're replying to you about it. This number counter just randomly, it just goes down no matter what's actually happening with donations. This is just a, a, a gift that just counts down, counting down from 549 at increments. Uh, and then on this side over here, the from field has been changed to make it appear as if you have responded to this email before. It's got me in the, it's from finance and me. And uh, the subject status pending makes it appear as though your money is being held up or you've something is you're in the middle of a process. And so what I've got now is I wanna show you uh, an Australian group used the data from this group and made a, a visual display of the, your inbox for Trump campaign emails during a period of time in 2019. So I'm gonna just play this, this little animation here. So you get a you get a sense about sort of the the tone and strategies of, of uh, what was being sent out. Uh, but then there was this really ugly money grab that occurred. Uh, I want to try to move my this thing. Okay, so this was the national um, Trump campaign fundraising. They they did it. Uh, this was a New York Times story that uncovered this, where uh, they started doing the tricky checkbox thing and making people, uh, they people agreed to uh, monthly donations rather than a one-time donation. And then, um, so you, you can read some of this. Uh, we need to know that we haven't lost you to the radical left. If you uncheck this box, we will have to tell Trump you're a defector and sided with the Dems. Check this box and we can win back the House and get Trump Trump to run in 2024. Make this a monthly recurring donation. So the checkbox, if you've read all the way through, if you haven't lost your train of thought by then, uh, if you if you leave a check, you're saying, I am not a defector and I'm paying you monthly for this donation. So somebody who's already come to give money, they've already said, I wanna make a donation is now being faced with this. And then on the other side, it escalated where uh, this is the final month, uh, and they were in sort of a, a funding a lull. So they said, make this a weekly recurring donation. Uh, and then after that, they said, we want a, another $100 to him on his birthday or something like that. So uh, the New York Times story was, was describing how there was this huge influx of people who were contacting their credit card companies and stuff saying, this is not what I signed up for. Uh, one example they give here is a 63-year-old cancer patient who was tricked into paying over $3,000 after initially meaning to donate just 500, which is 500 is already a lot, but they were saying, no, you're a traitor unless you give us all your money. 
that was pretty ugly. Okay, so what's being done to address deceptive design? Um, I like this techies for good. Uh, there's a number of groups that are working together to try to address some of these concerns. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some legislation and litigation. Uh, we heard about the LinkedIn settlement for $13 million when it was grabbing your address book and using it for their purposes. The Federal Trade Commission has hosted recently in 2021 a workshop bringing dark patterns to light to try to let developers know that the Federal Trade Commission was beginning to take this seriously and that they should watch what they're doing. The European Consumer Organization is litigating against Google for incorporating deceptive design into their account setup processes. And then in 2019, Mark Warner and Deb Fisher, uh, senators, introduced something in their deceptive experiences to online users reduction. It's called the Detour Act. Uh, it was bipartisan legislation. It didn't pass in 2019, and they're talking about re, re uh, bringing it back in, perhaps uh, integrating it with some other legislation in this current term. Uh, but the idea was that you uh, should not trick uh, consumers into handing over their personal data. So that's called the Detour Act. And the European Parliament uh, adopted in this yellow box, you can see on the right, the, their Digital Services Act. Europe, Europe has been doing more around data privacy than the United States at the moment. Their, their Services Act, Article 23 says, Providers of online platforms shall not design, organize, or operate their online interfaces in a way that deceives, manipulates, or otherwise materially distorts or impairs the ability of recipients of their services to make free and informed decisions. Uh, it might be hard to enforce, but it's starting to lay down a sort of a, 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 a standard. There's a, a story there uh, talking about some of the other ways that regulation is being addressed. Another way it's being done is the naming and shaming, sort of the hall of shame, where they're finding companies that are doing the bad thing and then make, taking a screenshot of it and sharing it, like they'll share it on Twitter, they'll share it in the Reddit uh, asshole design forum, <laughs> they'll share it in the, uh, so this is a deceptive design collection from Harry Brignall, and then another from a, a group of designers, the dark side of UX design page, they have a search where you can search and see examples from many different groups. AccuWeather has an example there. Uh, Audible, uh, different examples. Skype, uh, these are all examples that are part of this current naming and shaming approach. There's also uh, Consumer Reports Digital Lab work with a group of researchers to start the Dark Patterns tip line and uh, the darkpatternstipline.org where they were letting people who see something ugly send them, uh, take a screenshot of it and send it to them uh, to begin to, they also have a hall of shame on their site. Uh, there's a story about some of the learnings from the project that I put a link to there. Uh, this has moved from uh, Consumer Reports, it's gone to the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford University where it's being maintained. <clears throat> Also, people are being encouraged to complain to your state attorney general uh, in terms of deceptive practices that may cost consumers money or be uh, influencing their privacy in negative ways. This is the consumerresources.org has a page where you can find what's happening in your particular state if you want to file a complaint. The other thing that's happening, which is, I think, a longer term strategy, and I talked about the problem with the um, how tech companies are financed and how there's a lot of incentive for them to outmaneuver the, the other guy and get more people to stick on our site, be stickier than their site, to make our site more addictive than their site. Um, and so uh, there's a shift now saying, well, people who work in the tech industry who actually design and build these products need to start speaking up. They need to um, be the people who will uh, make the change, move us away from the, this sort of spiral that we're in now to something else. Uh, maybe you've been hearing stories about uh, teen loneliness and, and teen depression, teen suicide, where people who are watching Instagram and looking at how beautiful everybody else is, feeling not beautiful enough. It's been really hard for, for teens and for fa Facebook was put under some pressure because of research. They knew it was bad for student, you know, young people's health, but they were doing it anyway. 
Uh, some of that's been coming out. So there's a growing movement on what we call humane technology. And uh, the Center for Humane Technology is a key example of that. And they've been offered this, this online course for developers, for people who work in this area called the Foundations of Humane Technology. It's freely available. You can take it yourself if you're a curious user. So I have more than 13,000 people have taken the course so far. And I just want to play a, there's a clip here introducing the course so that we can hear a little bit about it. When future generations look back at the work of today's technologists, what will they see? Will they see products that helped us find meaning and balance, that helped us heal our communities and our democracies, and helped us find shared understanding? Or will they see clever hacks for maximizing engagement, algorithms that drove outrage, and a world where no one could tell fact from fiction? Today, we face massive global challenges, from worsening mental health to growing inequity, rising authoritarianism, and the climate crisis. One way or another, the technology we build will shape our collective capacity to solve those problems. Here at Center for Humane Technology, we believe that to build the technology that matters tomorrow, we have to start with different principles today. That's why we created Foundations of Humane Technology, an online course for people designing, developing, and distributing 21st century technology. Through course content, reflection questions, activities, external resources, and community events, you'll learn how to develop more humane technology that benefits society and aligns with your values. And you'll be doing so alongside thousands of technologists from around the world who are similarly concerned and eager to be of service. We have a momentous challenge in front of us, but it's one we must meet together. We hope you'll join us. Learn more at humanetech.com slash course. So they're doing some really, really great work. <clears throat> Another example, which is sort of related to the polarization in society. We talked about misinformation last time. Um, this is one that I kind of wish I could attend. It's happening in Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco at the end of February. And it's from a, a new council on technology and social cohesion, where the idea is that uh, technology has been used, sort of creating a wedge between people. And we need to start to design technology that moves us away from that division and toward more connection. So uh, social cohesion is the glue that holds society together in the face of toxic polarization. <clears throat> and so what they're doing is, is they're having this uh, multi-day event where they're showcasing software developers who are doing interesting work. They're looking at what we've learned from research about uh, polarization versus uh, communication, dealing with misinformation, <clears throat> dealing with hate, all of that sort of thing. And being somebody who's worked in the conflict resolution field in my life, I'm very interested in this sort of direction because we're, we're in a period now where it's really hard to talk to people about things where we disagree. <clears throat> so my question to you is what's a Quaker to do? Uh, are we committed to, you know, integrity and honest business relations? And if so, are we doing anything about this sort of creeping wave of, of ugly stuff that's been happening? Um, my question is, uh, what kind of a query might we offer friends for consideration? Uh, vices and queries are commonly used by friends groups to raise awareness. Uh, what might a query on deceptive design and the dangers of technological addiction sound like? You know, what would be included? I like this graphic here. This is from a, a friend's school where they took uh, some of their queries related to respect, relationships, and resilience and put them into a, a word cloud, a little word, word image for the different ones. But um, I wonder if people might share, like, what would you, what kind of query might help us be more reflective about this or help us go forward? Does anybody have any language they could think might be included? You'll have to unmute yourself. I everybody's muted right now. <clears throat> you know what I mean by a query, right? I'm asking you to kind of write on the spot. Joel's going to help us. Yeah, this is a. 
This is a tough one, Bill. Uh, I, I think the, the problem um, just coming today and, and uh, you know, uh, just having all of the language and vocabulary about deceptive practices and dark practices, and it was really enlightening and eye-opening. Uh, but if you were to ask me yesterday, you know, without having this background uh, to write a query, I, I would have a tough time with it. And I think people, you know, uh, just getting a query may also have a difficult time. I mean, I think we need to do things like taking your presentation, the recorded presentation and taking them back to our meetings. I think that's probably, a, to me, it would be a very good start. And then, uh, you know, from there, then we could get like a larger group of people that might be able to write a query. Okay. Yeah, I, Barbara maybe has got some ideas or Anne. I, one of the things I don't quite have the language, but I'm I'm really struck today by how how creeping this has been and how it's affected me personally. That I am approaching the world with much less trust. I assume when I'm online and someone asks me what seems like a straightforward question, that I'm on alert. That, that I think everybody's out to get me. You know, this is not a very Quakerly way to encounter the world. You know, and uh, so I feel like this this growing uh, way of doing business on on the, on the internet has um, has been eroding some of my own uh, personal uh, stance, the only way my own way in which I approach relationship and community. So I think I'd start to work with that if I were on a query. It's it's a personal so, level. So something about how has technology affected your personal relationships, or how has uh, the the design of our communication tools impacted our relationships. Are we addicted to our phones? <laughs> Cynthia's got an idea. Well, I think one thing we should ask ourselves to do is how much of a hurry are we to get things done as a society? Because I, I, I think a, some of the deceptive practices really requires one to really read carefully what is on the screen there and, and i think that it, it takes advantage you know the questions being asked really take advantage of the fact that everyone is in so you know everyone's in a hurry i mean myself included because i'm like oh my gosh you, i have five paragraphs to read through come on i i don't even have time to like you know do this <laughs> thank you so that's my thought wink <clears throat> I know that um, one of the things, and I, I'm not sure what the practices specifically are that I allow this to happen, but I give up way too much time to being on my device and not reading or not doing something else. And um, and I, I do think that's kind of an addiction. I really, when we were having trouble with our internet the week before last or the yeah and it wasn't working I felt like an addict who was in withdrawal because I couldn't watch a movie or I couldn't do this or I couldn't do that and I don't I don't know that I can, I find it hard to moderate yeah Mary <clears throat> well I would agree with the first person who brought up the fact that um, it would be difficult, I think, to write a query that someone who hasn't listened to you talk about this would understand even what we're asking them. Yeah. And I think when we do, when a query is written, it has to be very simple um, and relate more to the testimony that we want to hold up as positive as opposed to um, talking about the deceptiveness of, of things. Yeah, it, it's sort of like we're at the short end of the stick in this problem. So the question is, can Quakers have an impact? It may just be self-care and protection, or it may be a way where we could take this on more socially and address it. 
Barbara, what's your thought? Well, the thing that's flowing around in my mind right now has to do with um, how much do I succumb to doing things digitally, thinking that's the easy way, the quick way. And so I'm thinking something in the terms of, you know, ask, pausing and asking, are there alternatives? Are there other ways in which I can get the same needs met through people and connection? Because a lot of the, this is all done impersonal through um, technology um, and our addiction to global and access, you know, having access to everything. And so there's something in the query, like something in my mind saying, like, um, rather than just like, are there areas I cannot succumb to the digital electronic world? Are there still some choices I could make that would deal with human connection and more local? So it wouldn't be, let's become Amish and get rid of tech but it would be more, maybe there are places in our lives where the human connection could supplant the, the little buzz we get from the, the, the digital. Uh, and? Actually, it's Bob. Hey, Bob. It's, it's really quite frustrating. I <laughs> wrote to Amazon saying that this was a horribly confusing um, site when I was trying to uh, cancel an order. It wasn't a can, but it was it was a complicated refund thing. And um, what I realized in that process is that nothing I said was going to change anything. And so I, I mean, I think, and none of these websites are going to change their deceptive practice because we, as a user, say it's a deceptive practice and you need to change it. Um, really, in truth, I think the only thing that's going to change things is legislation and. Uh, uh, I don't think Amazon's website comes under the realm of kind of illegal practices. It's just very complicated. So I know there are groups like AARP, consumer protection groups, or larger lobbying groups that might lean into this a little bit. But you're you're making the point that as an individual, it feels like it's hard to to impact this. So I think some some companies respond when social media people call them out on social media. They get the squeaky wheel effect where they get some attention. Okay, uh, one more, go ahead, Ann. Yeah, I was just thinking that one of the things that's been very valuable for me in this and maybe a place for us to start is to get clear about this as being an immoral, unethical, wrong way to do business. You know, It's been so insidious and become so normalized and also so often being done by respected organizations and corporations and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's like when I see the TV ad where two people are standing at a desk and one's paid less than the other for the same room and he's gloating about it, I know that that's not fair pricing and it's unethical. You know, I'm very clear about that. Some of this stuff I'm much clearer about than I was an hour and a half ago. So thank you. But maybe that's also part of where we start. Thank you. I see we're reached time, so I'm gonna go ahead and just mention some of these resources that I've got here uh, that you can get on the slides. This deceptive design website by Harry Brignall, who's sort of the person who really got this area going. Um, this dark side of UX design website with its uh, collection of examples. There's also uh, the Data Detox Project, the technical tech folks, it's, they have a project called the Internet Made Me Do It. And it looks at some ways to sort of unplug a little bit um, there's the Dark Patterns tip line I mentioned. There's another game, Dark Patterns Experience game from the Dundee Design Festival, which uh, is it's almost maddening. Uh, and I don't know if I recommend it, but it sort of gives the experience of what's happening in some of these spaces. We did the markup quiz on Dark Patterns. That link is there. There's also this personal data uh, look at, that I mentioned from the Tactical Tech Group, where they look at uh, political persuasion and how data harvesting companies are doing that work. The Princeton Corpus of Political Emails, you can go in there and search by a particular candidate and see the emails that were clicked on from that candidate, which is quite interesting to see sort of what's happening with your senator or, or other things. Uh, there's the video on Quakers and the origin of the price tag from NPR Planet Money. 
There's the Humane Tech Data section of tips on how to take control over your so social media experience, which is a really nice collection of ideas. And then there's um, a youth toolkit from uh, Humane Tech Group uh, for young people, persuasive technology. How does technology use design to influence my behavior? Youth toolkit. So these are all uh, valuable things that you can get from the slides. And I guess that's going to do it for today. I uh, am so pleased to have a group to share with on, on this day. Um, the slides are going to be posted to the LEYM interest group page as well as the recording. And coming up on March 4th, we're doing a session on data brokers and modern surveillance, dangers for marginalized people, where we'll be talking about the different ways that law enforcement and, and prisons and customs and, and immigration are all really, really um, surveilling all of us. And some people are impacted by it more than others. So we're going to learn more about that. And I, I thank you all for, for joining us.